Scotland is one of the most interesting questions we need to start asking right now. Um, the assumption that Scotland as a, as a new independent nation isn't going to be able to manage the manufacture and sale of half keys and start because we're incapable of negotiating is something I would like to challenge quite quickly. I've met the UK Civil Service, they do not scare me. <laughs> but uh, more specifically, I thought I would maybe try and do something a bit pointy headed here rather than just go over again the fact that the Nordic nations are the nations which have achieved the highest level of um, social achievement probably in all societies ever and ask a little bit about why. Um, because while I come from the left, I do find myself disagreeing with some of the analysis from the left. One of the things which it's become normal to say is I'm not a nationalist, but. And the question I ask in return is, so what are you? Do you support kingdom, empire, theocracy, fascism, anarcho-syndicalism? Which mode of organizing the global society is it you favor? Nationalism is a truly wonderful thing. Now, again, in Britain, in the context, in particularly in Scotland, in the context that we work, that sometimes catches people in the hope. But I say, to draw a circle somewhere, and to see within that circle, however you got there, whoever you are, whatever kind of person you are, inside that circle, you're part of a community. When you add on democratic nationalism, you see you have an equal part in that society, at least in the capacity to make decisions in elections. That seems to me to be an extremely effective assessment assertion of the power of people to work together equally in a society. And I think nationalism should be welcome for that. Of course you get bad nationalism. Of course you get nasty nationalism. Just like you get nasty democracy. We're living in one. We're living in an era when our democracy has used its capacity to govern, to set one part for society, the majority, against another part for society, the poor, and to blame them for the causes of a catastrophe which have nothing to do with them. That's nasty democracy. Hitler was democratically elected. It's not an argument against democracy. So nationalism in itself is inherently inclusive. And I think that's something we sometimes forget. We live in Scotland. This debate has been framed for 30 or 40 years in terms of a movement which was growing in Scotland which the British establishment wished not to have a reasonable hearing. It's part, of the, it's part of the history of Scotland that getting a reasonable hearing to the suggestion that nations might have that degree of self-determination better able to represent the views of the people in that nation has been one which has been framed <coughs> deliberately in a certain way in this country. Which is what can lead it to a situation where I think it was awfully unfortunate for Joanne Lamont to think that it's okay to call a doctrine held by your political opponents a bias. And I think that was wrong. And I think that sort of tone is wrong. I, I can't agree more with everything that Joyce said. Because there's another thing where I sometimes find myself in some level of disagreement with the left. And it's in the fundamental question of which analysis explains why it is that we are in the mess that we are in. Why is it that we have these levels of inequality nationally and globally? And the standard answer to that used to be class. It is a class which did this to us. But I'm finding it increasingly difficult to kind of justify that. that. If it's a class which is doing this, the assumption is somehow we can identify that class, and if we can link them up against the wall and shoot them all in the old, in the old manner, suddenly we would be freed from the tyranny of global capitalism. And that's very obviously and blatantly not true. So the assumption which had always been there in the left from the beginning, that the battles are national, and the battles are between one class and another, a dominant class and a, and a working class, seems to me not to describe the challenge, the primary challenge that we have in front of us. Because the primary challenge that we have in front of us is a battle between global financial and corporate power versus the people. That is where the challenge lies. And it seems to me what we're talking about here is a battle between systems which are no longer even human. Frankly, most of what we are dealing with here are agreements, legal frameworks, which are created at the supranational level with the precise purpose of trying to overcome the inconvenience of democracy. We can't get the, the nations to vote quite the way that we would like them to vote, to create the trade policies that we would quite like so that we can dismantle their um, welfare state for commercial benefit. So we shall do it through the supranational model that we will use the WTO, the IMF, and to a, quite a degree, the, the EU, to, in effect, work our way around democracy. We will impose on people things they do not want without their consent. It seems to me 
that the battle which we may have in the coming century right across the world is not, first of all, a battle of class against class, but a battle of global power against democracy. That seems to me to describe how we have to move forward. If we look at the project that we are working just now, the Commonweal project, um, I could have easily talked here about the Nordic societies being the best. I could tell you why. I could go over all the sorts of reasons why they tend to be much more effective building social and economic outcomes for people. But I think what's probably interesting when you look at that is the question about their relationship with the global, with the international. These are not un-international countries, and yet they have high wages. So where was the debate in their countries about capital funds, about the assumption that we are weak and that we are powerless? The idea that they have good industrial democracy, and yet they still have a private sector. If you listen to some of the things that have been said in Scotland since Grangemouth, you would assume that giving employees any form of industrial democracy whatsoever is tantamount to moving straight to some sort of uh, third world state for our nation. That you can't touch the corporations. You can. You can do what you want with the corporations up until a certain degree through collective will of democracy. And I'll just give you a, a couple of examples. The WTO as a negotiating body is dead. Anybody who tells you that we couldn't have a different approach to international trade doesn't know what's going on in the world. Since the door round, it has been impossible to do that process of countermanding the will of nations, the will of democracies. And why? Because for our great benefit, a group of Latin American countries got together with Mercosur and said, no, enough, we do not accept this. That is national democracy facing down international global power. And already international trade negotiations are no longer multinational. They tried twice, they failed. Um, the democracy of Latin America prevented them from doing this, and now international trade agreements are primarily being developed in a bilateral nature. Is it better or worse? Let's hope it's better. We will see. But that was a democratic decision to face down global power. Or what about us? There is nothing you can do about corporation tax evasion. It is just the way of the world. This is absolute garbage, complete rubbish. It is perfectly legal to tax a corporation on a proportion of its global turnover related to the amount of in-country sales that company has made. So, Amazon makes X million, X billion internationally. X percent of that is in-country sales in Scotland. You can simply prorata it. We cannot avoid it. It's a zero avoidance strategy. Other countries more or less do this. You can face down global power, but only through democracy. Which brings me to the question of Scotland. Is Scotland um, in any way a better science of nation for tackling this? Well, I would like to argue that there is a chance, a chance, that looking back now, looking back in hundred years to now, this will be the start of a century of significant change across the world. It is possible that Scotland might be able to set a model for global governance which challenges the globalisation model of the last 30 years. It is great that we have the Nordic countries, and yet the Nordic countries have always been framed in UK political debate as weird, just plain <laughs> wrong. I've heard people speculate in maybe it's the it's amount of fish fats they eat or something, there's something strange about those people's heads, and there's something genetically wrong with them. Often this is phrased in pseudo braininess by saying, oh yes, but it's a different historical and cultural context. Yes, but what they do still works. And we can emulate that, we can devise and develop it here. And if we do, it is that thing of saying, it is all very well to be good and stay that way, it is something better to be bad and to become good. If Scotland can break this model, if we can, in a couple of years' time, begin the process of redeveloping a nation, reflecting the views and the interests of the members of that nation, and not, unfortunately, as we have in the British state, a closed state which organises affairs with very little um, reference to the democratic will of the people. If we can do that, and if we can create a Scotland which challenges global neoliberalism, neoliberal capitalism and does something better, then this may be a model that can take us forward, that others can see. Uh, if you were on the march for independence a few weeks ago, you would 
know that we are being watched very closely by Catalans and Sardinians, by people from Cornwall and Wales and Ireland, by the Basques, by the South Tyrolese, I can't even remember them all. These people are looking towards us because we can start a process. And if that process can show that by taking government closer to people, it is easier for the people to keep control of that government, we may create a model which can create genuine international change. Because it's true. Because if you look at the countries which have, better able, have been better able to reflect the genuine will of their people, they are either small or they have very high levels of internal devolution. Because the closer, that's me thing, because the closer <laughs> they get to their people, the more the people can hold them in control. And so, um, what I would suggest is that Scotland has the capacity to set a model for the world. And if that model works, and if people realise that many, many smaller states, properly reflecting their people, working collectively together, can create a global governing system which is more positive and more um, beneficial for everybody, and will address many of those issues that globalisation has caused, such as climate change, etc., etc., then we may move forward to a model of democratic global politics which inherently becomes more left-wing because it inherently reflects people and not power. <coughs> in the end, if we could succeed in doing that, by the end of this century, we might achieve something which I think would be globally beneficial to all. The defederation of the United States of America. What a fabulous <laughs> 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 <laughs>